Hi everyone, uh, we'll start in a few minutes. Let's just wait for everyone to get here and then we'll start. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, okay, so again, we'll just wait a few minutes and then we'll start. Okay, so uh, let's keep going. So, um, okay, so last class, uh, last class we ended with um, talking about fair games. And so we saw an example uh, of a game that was unfair, but changing the, the fee made it fair, okay? And so then we, the conclusion was that if the fee was 92 cents, then the game was fair, right? And a fair game was one where the expected value was zero, okay? Um, and so we also talked about before that the, the strong law of large numbers. And so we also talked about the strong law of large numbers, okay? And we talked about some other things. We talked about why E of X is the mean. So that was last class. Um, and so uh, this class, we're going to uh, continue with this section. Uh, so the next section is 6.2.2, point, 6 uh, which is on decision problems. Okay, so this is example 6.9. Um, so a newly formed uh, company plans to send a number of employees uh, each year to an annual one day conference held in an out of town hotel. The hotel offers a bargain rate of $30. Per day, per person. If the reservations are received, 30 or more days in advance. However, uh, there is a cancellation fee of $15 per person. This is a long problem. Uh, the regular rate. is $40 per day per person. The company cannot be certain thirty days in advance of the exact number of employees it will send. However, management feels if capital X is the number it will send, then capital X is a random variable 
with probability function. F of x is equal to one fourth, or x equals to four, five, six, and seven. Okay, the question is should company make advanced reservations? If so, how many? Give, give the answer that will minimize costs in the long run. Okay, so that's example 6.9. So I'll read it again. Um, example 6.9 is a decision problem. A newly formed company plans to send a number of employees each year to an annual one day conference held in an out-of-town hotel. The hotel offers a bargain rate of $30 per person if the reservations are received 30 more days in advance. However, there is a cancellation fee of $15 per person. The regular rate is $40 per day per person. The company cannot be certain 30 days in advance of the exact number of employees it will send. However, Management feels if capital X is the number it will send, then capital X is a random variable with probability function f of x equals one fourth for x equals four, five, six, seven. Should the company make advance reservations? If so, how many? Give the answer that will minimize costs in the long run. Okay, so that's the problem. And so let's talk about the solution. So let's let let's introduce some variables. So, so let y sub i equal the cost in dollars if the company makes reservations for i people. Okay, so the possible values of y sub of y sub four are Okay, so this is the cost in dollars if company makes reservations for I people. So Y sub four means the cost of in dollars if the company makes reservations for four people. So the possible values of Y sub four are 120 if four attend. Okay. So if all four, if they make reservations for four people and if four people attend, then it's $30 per day per person. Okay. So for one day, it's $120, right? It's 120, 30 times four. Okay. It's 160 if five attend, right? So if five attend, then they made advanced reservations for four, and each was, was at a cheaper rate of $30 per person. So four times 30 is 120, but then a fifth person went, and so they have to pay the regular rate for the additional extra person, which is another $40, right? This is $40, the regular rate is $40 per day per person. Uh, so it's 120 plus 40 for the additional person, so it's 160, and then it's 200 if six attend, because now another person of the regular rate, another 40 has to be paid for that additional person. And then if there's seven, then it's 240 if seven attend, okay? So if seven attend, uh, then another 40 gets added on to 200, okay? So again, there's only, the, the only possibilities are that four, five, six, or seven people attend, right? And so these are the values of Y sub four if four, five, six, or seven people attend, okay? So we know the probability for each of these values, right? Because there's a one fourth chance each of these four things happen. And so since we know the values and we know the probabilities, we can compute the expected value of this variable y sub four. So we can find the expected value of y sub four. And so that's 120 times the probability of four people going plus 160 times the probability of uh, five people go plus 200 times the probability six people go plus 
240 times the probability uh, seven people go. Okay, and so you add up those products and you get 180. Okay, this is 30 plus 40 plus 50 plus 60. Um, and so that's 180. Okay, so that's the expected value of Y sub 4, uh, the cost in dollars of company makes reservation for four people. Okay, so um, next, um, so the equally likely uh, possibilities at, of Y sub 5. Right, if they make reservations, the cost if the company makes reservations for five people are uh, so it could be $135 if four people attend. Okay, so if they make reservations for five people, they spend uh, five times 30, which is the cheapest rate, they spend $150 um, on. Five, but only four attend, and so they get they have to pay. A, so they, um, and so instead of paying thirty, they have to pay fifteen, right? So, uh, so a cancellation fee of fifteen means, in a sense, they get back the thirty dollars, but they have to pay fifteen. So, uh, if if they made reservations for five, then four of them is the cheaper rate, which is one hundred twenty. Four times thirty is one hundred twenty. And then the fifth person, instead of being 30, it's $15. It's 30 minus, right? So it's it's $15, right? Uh, so the fee is 15. So 15 is for that fifth person, even though they didn't use it. Okay, so then, um, so that's Y sub 5. Um, so, so 135 if four people attend. Now, if five people attend, it's 150. And this is if five attend. And so if five people attend, five times 30 is 150, and that works out. And then next is 190 if six attend, because five were at the cheaper rate of, of 30, 150, and then one was at the regular price of 40, so it's 190. And then it's 230 um, if seven attend. Okay. And so that means that the expected value of y sub 5 is equal to each of those values times the probabilities, which is 1 fourth. So it's 135 times 1 fourth plus 150 times 1 fourth plus 190 times 1 fourth plus 230 times 1 fourth. And so if you add up these products, you then get $176.25. So this is actually a little cheaper um, in the long run than Y sub 4. Okay, and so now uh, continuing in this sense, if you wanted to calculate E sub E of, of Y sub 6, you would just find each possible value of y sub six and multiply it by one fourth the probability of it being that value. So if you make reservations for six people, right, in advance, and only four people attend, um, then four is at the bargain rate of 30, so it's 120. And then there's a cancellation fee of 15 for each of the two people that you have to cancel. So it's 120 plus 30, and that's 150. It's 150 times one fourth. Plus, if you make six reservations in advance and five people show up, then it's five times 30, which is 150, plus the cancellation fee of 15, which is 165. That's 165 times one fourth. Plus, if six people attend and you make reservations to answer six, six times 30 is 180. This is a one fourth chance of that. And then if seven people attend and you made six reservations in advance, six times 30 is 180 plus 20 plus 40 is 220, 220 times one fourth. And so you add up those products and you get 178.75. Okay. Uh, and so this is a little bit higher. So Y sub five has the lowest expected value so far. 
and then e of e of y sub seven is equal to if four people attend in advance, if seven reservations in advance, four people attend, four times 30 is 120, 103 times 15, 45, 165, 165 times one fourth. So four people attend, right? Um, if four people attend, 30 for each of the people who you have advanced reservations for, four times again, four times 30 is 120, and there's three cancellations, so that's three times 15. That's 45 plus the 120, that's 165. Now, five people go, that's five times 30, which is 150, uh, plus two cancellations, which is 180. That's 180 times one fourth. But then plus, if six people attend, six times three, six times 30 is 180, plus the cancellation fee 15, 195 times one fourth. Um, and then plus, if all seven people attend and you made reservation for seven, that's seven times 30, which is 210. Let's say you get the best deal for, for that. And, and so then, then um, that's e that sum of products is equal to $187.50. Okay, so this goes way up. Uh, and so you have, to, you have to do a lot of cancellations if fewer people show up. Okay, and so the conclusion from all this is that since E of Y sub five okay, is the smallest, the company should make advanced reservations for five people. Okay, so considering the possibilities of how many people will attend, on average, making five reservations in advance will come out cheaper. Okay. Okay. Now, now let me just let me just make a point here. So, if you if you made zero reservations in advance, right? If you made zero reservations in advance, then you would have. Uh, Everything would be 40. So if four people attended, it would be it would cost $160, right? And there'd be a one-fourth chance of that, plus uh, 200 times one-fourth, uh, plus if six people attended, it would be 240 times one-fourth, and then plus uh, 280 times one-fourth. Right, and so that's so. Then, if you add up those, uh, you get forty plus fifty plus sixty uh, plus seventy. Right, four, five, six, seven, nine, fifteen, twenty-two. So you have two hundred and twenty here. Okay, so so um, if you do not make any reservations. And the expected value is 220, right? So you can see that. So you can see that making reservations in advance saves you money in the long run. Uh, so on average, you'd be paying 220, where here it's 176, but it's actually all of them are cheaper. And so uh, this conclusion, this is our conclusion here. Since E of Y sub five is the smallest, the company should make advanced reservations for five people. And this is for uh, possible values of, of this four in advance, right? I mean, there's no reason to make three in advance, right? Because you know there's gonna be, the only possible values are four, five, six, or seven. So there are always gonna be at least four people attending. So having put giving three in advance doesn't make any sense. You might as well choose four, right? So that's why we're not considering E Y sub one, E Y sub two, E sub Y sub three, right? Because these are the only possible values. Okay. So technically here, this is E of Y sub zero, right? You're making zero reservations in advance. Okay. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna preface this as keep this in mind. Okay. If you do not make any reservations, then the expected value is that. So you can see that making advanced reservations saves you money in the long run. Okay, so that was a long problem, and I'm glad that's over. Uh, so let's let's do another one. This is example six point ten, and so this is an inventory problem. In any one week, uh, the number of requests uh, for a magazine is a random uh, variable, capital X, with probability function f of x is equal to Five twelfths for x equals three. Uh, four twelfths for x equals four. Two twelfths for x equals five. And one twelfth for x equals six. Uh, so that means that the probability of getting three requests is five twelfths. The probability of getting four requests is four twelfths, and so forth. Okay. The magazine uh, sells for one dollar, and the cost to the owner is fifty cents. How many magazines? Should he order from the publisher per week if he wishes to maximize the expected profit? Okay. So, so the problem is, is that uh, you know, if he sells the magazine, it's for one dollar, but every magazine he has cost him 50 cents, right? So if he gets too many magazines to sell and he doesn't sell enough of them, he's incurring the cost of the of 50 cents for each magazine he doesn't sell, right? So it's important to know the likelihood of, of how likely it is that he's going to sell these different numbers of magazines, right? In order to maximize his profit so he doesn't buy too many magazines to sell and also that he doesn't not buy enough, right? Okay. So uh, let I sub I equal to the profit in dollars if the owner buys I magazines. Okay, so the Y sub I is the profit uh, for the owner if he buys I magazines. Okay, so. Um, Let's see. How can I do this? Um, okay, so these are values of X that I'm going to put here. Um, and so I'm going to make a table. Okay, so we have capital X, right? So um, okay, so capital X is the number of requests for a magazine, right? So you could either have three requests, four requests, five requests, or six requests. Okay, and so uh, <laughs> there's still six. Um, so let's say let's say we look at the random variable y sub three, right? Which is the uh, profit in dollars if the owner buys i magazines. So if he buys three magazines 
and he sells free magazines. Um, then, then since he 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 buys three magazines at fifty cents each, so that's a dollar fifty he spends. But he makes three dollars on the three he sells. Okay, so he buys three and he sells three, and so he makes a dollar. He makes a dollar fifty. Okay, so these are these numbers are in terms of dollars. So he makes a dollar fifty. Now, if um, now if there are four requests, but he only buys three magazines, he can only make a dollar fifty, right? And same thing. So no matter how many requests he has for magazines, he can only sell three of them because he only bought three. And so the values for each of those are dollar fifty. Now, if he if he if he buys four magazines and he sells three of them, then he spent two dollars on the four magazines and he made three. So his net profit is a dollar, right? So in all of these, he spends two dollars on four magazines, 50 cents each. 50 cents times four, he spends two dollars on magazines. So if he spends two dollars on magazines, right, and now he sells four, he makes four dollars. And so the net gain is two dollars. He still spent two dollars, now he makes five, so the net is three. And if he spent two and he makes six, the net oh sorry wait wait sorry he only he only uh he only uh, bought four so he, he can't make more than two dollars so so even if there are five or six requests he only sells four because he only has four to sell okay next is y sub five capitals so y sub five is he buys five in advance so that costs 250 right it costs 250 dollars to buy five in advance and he sells three. So that means it's a net 50 cent gain. But if he sells uh, four now, right, 250 and he makes four, that's a net of a dollar fifty. Now, if he sell if he if he if he gets five magazines and he sells all five of them, then that's a 250 net gain, right? 250 plus five. But then if, if he has six requests, he can only sell five still. And so he still makes 250 in that situation. Now for Y6, for Y6, right? He buys six magazines in advance. That costs him $3. And he if he has three requests, that means the net is zero. Okay. If he, he can sell four of them, then it's four minus three, and there's a one dollar net gain. Okay, and then if there if five if if he can sell five of them, that's five minus three, it's two dollars net. And if he sells all six of them, then he's made a three dollar three dollar profit. Okay, now here I want to put the probability that capital X is equal to that value little x. So what is the probability, right, that that uh, that he will get three requests? Uh, it's five twelfths. The probability that he gets four requests is four twelfths. Probably he gets five requests is two twelfths, and the probability he gets six requests is one twelfth. Okay, so those are the probabilities of each uh, value of x. And so now a matter of finding the expected value of each is simple. You can just refer to the table and um, take each value and multiply it by its corresponding probability. So for instance, here we have a dollar fifty that he can make. He can make a dollar fifty here, right? Um, but it's times. Just click here. It's times the probability that y sub three is equal to a dollar fifty. So the probability that y sub three is equal to a dollar fifty, well, that's one because even if he gets four, or five, three, four, or five, or six requests, in in all cases he would only sell three of them. Okay, and so if he only sells three of them, 
that means his net profit would be a dollar fifty. So y sub three is a dollar fifty. The probability of that is one, and so this is a dollar fifty times one, which is a dollar fifty. So that's the expected value of y sub three. The expected value of y sub four is well. What are the possible values of y sub four, which is the profit if he buys four magazines? It's a one dollar or two dollars, right? So if it's one dollar, the value of y sub four, you take one one times the probability that y sub four is equal to one, and then plus two, which is the other value times the probability that y sub 4 is equal to 2. And so when you take them and you multiply them, so the probability y equals 1 is 1 fourth. Uh, and so this probability is 1 times 1 fourth. This is a 1 fourth chance uh, of him getting uh, three requests, which corresponds with this uh, profit of one dollar. Now, the the other value is two, but the probability that his net profit is two is not one fourth. It's one fourth plus one fourth plus one fourth. It's the probability that that he gets four or five or six requests. That's three fourths. And so now, if you add up those products, you get a dollar and thirty three. No, wait, no, sorry. You get a dollar and fifty-eight cents. So that's the expected value of y sub four. The expected value of y sub five, you calculate similarly. And so where are the possible values of y sub five? They're 0 0.5, 1 1.5, and 2.5. So 0 0.5, the probability of 0 0.5 is one fourth plus uh, 1.5, which has a probability of one fourth. Plus, now the other value is 2.5, but there's a 50% chance because one fourth plus one fourth is one half. There's a one half chance of that. And so now if you add up those products, you get a dollar and 33 cents. And so the other one is E of Y sub five, and E of Y sub five uh, y sub 6. E of y sub 6 is take each possible value of y sub 6, 0, 1, 2, and 3, and multiply them by their probability. So 0 times 1 fourth plus 1 times 1 fourth plus 2 times 1 fourth plus 3 times 1 fourth. Okay, and then you add up those products and you get 0 0.92. Um, so he wants to maximize his expected profit, right? Um, did I... Oh, right here. Okay. Right. How many magazines should he order for the publisher from for the publisher per week if he wants, wishes to maximize profit? So the largest number here, right, is 1.5. So this is the largest one, right? And so that largest number corresponds with y sub four, right? That the expected of value of y sub four is the largest expected value. So then uh, that means that he should sell, um, that he should order four in advance, right? So in order to maximize expected profit, he should order um, from the publisher four per week, okay? This is the conclusion. All right, so that's the conclusion. All right, any questions about this example? The inventory problem? Yep.
All right, let's keep going. Um, so next is 6.2.3, which is on Monte Carlo methods. Okay, so this is example 6.11. Uh, this is the Monte Carlo method for evaluating uh, definite intervals. So I'm gonna put this on the next page. So let's say uh, V of X, V of U is continuous on A less or equal to U less or equal to P and is bounded uh, below and above by 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 zero less or equal to b of u less or equal to m. So it's bounded below by zero um, and bounded above by m. At the values of phi okay, on this interval from A to B. Consider the experiment, capital S, where a random uh, U comma V is selected from A less or equal to U less or equal to B. And zero less or equal to V less or equal to M. Let capital X be the random variable defined as capital X is equal to one if the point uh, is below the curve of B of U and zero otherwise. Okay. Observe that the probability that x equals 1 is equal to uh, the area under the curve over the area of the rectangle. OK, so I'll, I'm going to draw the picture for you so you can see what I mean. OK, so um, consider this experiment S, where a random point u comma v is selected from uh, this rectangle here, where a, u is from a to b, v is from 0 to m. And x is a random variable defined as 1 if the point is below v and 0 otherwise. So I'm going to draw this on the whiteboard to explain it. When you see the picture, it's a lot, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, so here's the y-axis. And so here's the u-axis. Um, so actually, I'm going to call this the phi of u axis. Okay. This is going to be the phi of u axis. And so M here, capital M is, is just a, a, a real number here. Little a is a number here, little b is a number over here, greater than a. And so we have the range of u values between a and b. And we have the range of phi of u values from 0 to m. And so that means is that if you have your phi of u curve, it looks like this. OK, so if phi of u is this, this is. Um, y equals v of u, okay, then the area underneath this curve 
of this space. Right? This is the area of the space in the rectangle where it's bounded by the x-axis and the curve. Right? So if there's a point and it lies in that in that pink region, then right, the value of x is one. And if it's not, if it's somewhere here, we're only looking inside this rectangle here. Right? So if it's a point here, x is zero. And if it's a point here, x is one. Okay, so we can ask the question, what is the probability that x equals one? Well, the probability x equals one is the area of this pink region, the area under the curve, divided by the total area of the rectangle. That is the probability that x will return a value of one because x is one in this pink for points in this region and x is zero for points not in this region. Okay, so it's the ratio of, the air, of this pink area divided by the total area of this rectangle. That ratio is the probability that x equals one. Okay, so let me go back to here. So the probability x equals one is the area under the curve divided by the area of the rectangle. And so that's equal to the def integral from a to b of b, of u du divided by capital M times b minus a. Okay, and so the area under the curve is the integral from a to b of b of u du, and then the area of the rectangle is capital M times b minus a, right? So that's because capital M is the height and b minus a is the width, right? Length times width. So this times this is capital M times b minus a. That's the area of the large rectangle. And then the integral from a to b of B of U du is the area of the pink region. Okay. Okay, and so that's the probability x equals one. And so the probability x equals zero, you can get from that and it's equal to one minus the probability that x equals one. So once you find the probability x equals one, probability x equals zero is one minus that probability. Okay, so therefore, um, therefore, uh, e of x is equal to one times the probability of x equals one plus zero times the probability that x equals zero. And so what is that probability? That equals one times, well, the probability x equals one is this. It's one times that plus zero, right? Plus zero times this probably, probably x equals zero, which doesn't matter because you're multiplying by zero. Okay. And so then that's equal to just that, um, this fraction right here. One times this is this plus zero, right? Okay. So the expected value is equal to that. And, um, and so that means that this depth and integral is equal to capital M times B minus A times E of X. Okay, just cross multiply, right? So then M times B minus A times E of X is equal to that integral. Right. If we perform the experiment, um, capital S n times, and n is large, uh, and letting um, x sub i equal the value of capital X on the i performance. Uh, of capital S, then by the strong law of large numbers, we get that the sum the sum over all the values of 
x. So sum from i equals 1 to n of x sub i over n, the number of times you perform the experiment, should be approximately e of x. Right? This is by the strong law of large numbers earlier. right? And so we should see that the average of the results of your experiment should be approximately the mean as long as n is sufficiently large, okay? With great probability. Okay. So it's very, 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 very likely that, uh, that this average will be close to the expected value for large n, and that's by the strong law, again, a strong law of large numbers we did earlier. Another last class, I think. So therefore, uh, So therefore, um, the integral, this integral, right? This integral is approximately this integral is approximately m times b minus a times uh, it would be e of x. So e of x is approximately this. Right, so if e of x is approximately this and this equals this times this, replacing e of x with this means you get a quantity that's close to it. Right? And so the integral is equal to m times b minus a times that fraction with great probability. Just like there's great probability that e of x is this, there's great probability that this integral is equal to this times this times this. Okay, and so what this does now is there's, it's a method of approximating a definite integral. On the left, we have a definite integral, and on the right, we have m times b minus a times the sum of these x values divided by n. Okay, so let's look at an example that, that uses this. This is example 6.12. And so this is the Monte Carlo uh, estimate of the definite integral. from zero to one of e to the u squared over two uh, du. So the Monte Carlo estimate of that Okay, so let's look at phi of u. So phi of u is equal to e raised to the, um, oh wait, sorry, wait, this is, I want negative sign in front. This is negative, but I want to put the negative sign in front of the fraction right there. Very good. So it's integral from zero to one of e to the negative u squared over two d. Okay. So this guy. So phi of u so phi of u is equal to uh, e to the u e to negative u squared over two and m is equal to one, a is equal to zero, and b is equal to one. Okay, so you have this definition here from zero to one, so that corresponds with a equals zero and uh, b equals one. Okay, and m is gonna equal one. Okay, so now let's take the def integral of this guy. So, the definite rule of that is equal to uh, is equal to e of x. But because m is one, so here we have that the integral is equal to m, which is one, times b minus a, which is one minus zero. And so this just becomes the integral is equal to e of x. Okay. And we have that the 
that integral is approximately is approximately there we go is approximately this right because that is the expected value right that's the expected value so it's approximately that like we said earlier uh, by the strong of large numbers um, so using uh, the random numbers in table four so this is, there's a table of random numbers in appendix c uh, uh, if if i if i want you to use it i'll i'll, I'll let you know okay but uh, i just want to make so so what happens is you have this definite integral you have this definite integral here okay and so this is approximately equal to uh to the sum right this here okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to choose n to be 17. okay so i'm going to perform this experiment of choosing a number at random uh 17 times okay x sub i is the result of each of those 17 iterations of the experiment right so each time you choose a number at random in the rectangle, right? And there's a curve there, that, that e to negative u squared over two curve. If it's below the curve, it returns a one. And if it doesn't, it returns a zero. And so you do this 17 times, you randomly choose a number in that rectangle, okay? And so there's a way to define a random process, okay? Where you choose something randomly. And so if you randomly choose something, then given that space, then you may get that you chose 15 out of 17 of them underneath the curve. And if you calculate that, you get 0.8824, okay? So what happened is, is that if you, so you might, you might see that if you randomly choose 15 points in the rectangle, 15 of them will return a one, meaning they're below the curve, and two will not, will return a zero because they're not below the curve. And so 15 over 17 is the value of this, which is an approximation of the depth integral is 0.8824. Okay, it might seem hard to believe or impossible that randomly making decisions in this rectangle will return an approximation of the area, of an area. But it can make some sense if you, if you start thinking about it. Like for instance, if the curve was very short, if it was near the bottom of your rectangle, and the rectangle is really big in comparison, you would, barely un, you would be very unlikely to hit a point below the curve if you, ran, if you chose one at random, right? And you might even choose zero of them, right? It might be zero out of 17. So approximation of this very small space would be zero. Now, if you take up most of the space with below your curve and you choose a point random in the rectangle, then every point might be below the, be below the curve. And so 17 out of 17, which is one, would be an approximation of that area, right? So, so you can kind of see how if the more space that's underneath your curve, the more likely you are when you choose points at random to choose one underneath the curve. And the less space underneath the curve, the less likely you are to choose a point randomly underneath the curve, which means that ratio is smaller, right? And so the larger the region is, the, the larger the, the probability is, the larger the average number of times that you choose one at random below the curve is. And so you can kind of see how Intuitively, how that it might make sense that this ratio would give you an approximation of the area in that rectangle with height one starting at a equals zero and ending at b equals one. Okay. Okay, so this says that the Monte Carlo estimate is 0.8824 and the value uh, using the table. is 0.8555, okay? So it's close. Okay, 6.3. Um, the mathematical uh, expectation of a function of a random variable.
Okay, so the mathematical expectation of a function of a random variable. Definition. Okay, so this is definition 6.3. Let capital X be a random variable uh, defined on a sample space, capital S. Let G be a real valued function defined for values little x that are possible values of capital X or or we could say that negative infinity is strictly less than x strictly less than infinity the random variable g of x is defined on capital S as follows. For each little s in capital S, g of capital X of little s is equal to G of capital X of capital S. Okay, oh, the, this is a little s. So let a capital X be a random variable defined on a sample space capital S. Let G be a real valued function defined for values X that are possible values of capital X, right? Or X, any real number of little X. The random variable G of capital X is defined on capital S as follows. For each little S in capital S, G of capital S of S is G of capital X of little S, okay? So G of X is just a function of S. Let, let's let's look at an example. Okay, it's easier with an example. Example six point fourteen. Let capital S be an experiment of rolling, well, rolling two dice, and let capital S equal i, comma j, such that i is equal to one, two, three, four, five, or six. And j is equal to one, two, three, four, five, or six. Okay, and let this s be the sample space for capital S. It's repetitive. Okay, let capital X be the sum of values of two dice so that x of i comma j is equal to i plus j for i comma j in capital S. I can get that back, okay. <laughs> I don't wanna write that down again. Okay, so, um, okay, so S is an experiment of rolling two dice, okay? And S is equal to this set, but S equal to this set, right? So. Uh, oops. Okay. okay, so it's the ordered pairs i comma j, where each i and j are both between one and six inclusive. And so s is the sample, this is our sample space of uh, rolling two dice. So x, our, our random variable capital X, is the sum of the values of the two dice. And so if the result of your experiment is i comma j, i on the first row, j in the second row, then x of i comma j is a function, right? Where the input is the outcome of the experiment i comma j, telling you the first row was an i, the second row was a j, and the output is the number i plus j, okay? So again, capital X is a random variable, meaning that the input is the result of the experiment of rolling two die that tells you the, the outcome of the first row and the outcome of the second row. And then the output is the sum of those two values i plus j, okay? So that, that capital X is a random variable, which is a function. 
let g be the function. Uh, let g be the function g uh, of x of i comma j. Oh, Let g be the function uh, g of x is equal to x squared, which is simple enough so far, for um, negative infinity less than x less than infinity. Okay, and so what is what is g of capital X? That's different from g of little x. Okay, so g of capital X is itself a random variable. So g, little g of capital X of i comma j, right? The outcome of the experiment is i comma j, and g of x is now another random variable. Well, this random variable um, tells you, okay, well, g is going to be uh, uh, the value on capital X of i comma j. So, right, x of i comma j is the sum of the two values i and j. And so g is now a random variable whose input is x of i comma j. And so this is g of i uh, plus j. Okay. But g, again, is a function that squares the input. So i plus j is being squared. So you take i plus j and you square it. And so this is for i comma j in f less. Okay, so capital X is a function that outputs i plus j. G is a function where if you input x of i comma j, you get i plus j, but g of i plus j is its square. Okay, so. Uh, G of X, G of capital X is the random variable, is the random variable that represents the sum, the, sum, the square of the sum, uh, the values of two dice. Okay. Where X is the sum of two dice, G of X is the sum is the square of the sum of two dice. Okay, so x would be summing it, but g of x would be after you sum it, you then square it. Okay, so g of x is the random variable that represents the square of the sum of the two values of the dice. The input of g of x is i comma j still, the result of rolling two dice. I is the first roll, j is the second roll. So i comma j is the outcome of the experiment, but g of x as a function, you input the outcome of the two rolls, i comma j, and it outputs i plus j in parentheses squared. Do that. Okay. So, okay. So g of x, right? So just to explain this again, if, if you have the random variable x, right, a random variable is a function. So x is a random variable. If you input the outcome of the experiment, i comma j into it, the output is i plus j, right? Again, the input is an outcome of the experiment. And the output is the sum of the two dice rolls. G of x is thus another um, is another random variable. And to express that, it's really kind of a composition of two functions. So first you have x, where if you input i comma j, the output is i plus j. But now if you input the i plus j into the function g, which is the square, remember g of x is x squared, the output is i plus j squared, right? And so a composition of two functions is itself a function. And so the composition of first x and then g is a, you could call it a single function, g of capital X. So g of capital X, it, which is g of, g of x of i comma j, g of capital X is then first x and then g, first x and then g. And so if the input is i comma j, the output is i plus j squared, where x just summed them and g squared them. G of x first sums them and then squares them. It does it in one, in one command, in a sense, one function. Okay. 
So g of x is the composition of the random variable x with post composition by the function g, g of x is x squared. See that? So that's what g of x is. It's also a random variable because the input is an outcome of the experiment and the outcome is a number, i plus j squared. Okay, so that's explaining um, what a random variable x is doing here and what g of x is doing. They're both random variables. Inputs are both outcomes of the experiment and the outputs are both real numbers. i plus j here, i plus j squared there. Okay. Okay, so g of x is that. Okay. Um, so for the function g of capital X above, we may write capital X squared instead. Okay, so capital X squared represents the, the G of X here, which is first X and then squared, right? So X squared would mean first perform the random variable X and then square the result. So that's X squared. All right, so that's for shorthand. So similarly, um, if G of capital X is equal to A naught plus A one X plus A two X squared plus dot 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 plus A N x to the n, then g of x is written as a naught uh, plus a1 x plus a2 a2 x squared plus dot 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 plus a sub n x to the n. Okay, so instead of writing g of x equals to this polynomial, you could instead write g of x as this. a naught plus a1 x plus a2 x squared plus dot 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 plus a n x to the n. Okay, without even writing g of x, you can just write that. All right. Okay, so, um, all right, so uh, did I, let's see, did I sign homework last class? Uh, if, uh, let me see for a second. Right, so homework seven. I signed last class, right? Okay, so homework seven. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so so my next thing is any questions? About homework seven? So any questions about homework seven? Okay, so we had homework seven. Uh, I'm going to put this on the screen. It was pretty short. So it was just these, right? So you have X as a standard normal random variable. Find that probably X will take on values, right, inside some of these ranges. Uh, so this is no questions. Uh, I'll just randomly choose one. So let's, let's do one uh, part C. So X is a standard normal random variable. We'll find that probably the X takes on values between 1.5 and 2.4. Okay, so uh, 1.5 and 2.4. So this is number one. All right, so if you have questions, ask out loud. Okay, so so number one, uh, give you're given capital X is a standard normal random variable. Okay, and so we want to find find the probability that. That, that X will take in a value between, let's say 1.5 and 2.14, 1.5, 2.14, 1.5 and 
2.14. Okay, so we want to find that probability. Okay, um, so we can just use the t you, you can just use the table. First, you have to make it you know into values the table will tell you. So so you have this is the probability of zero um, less than x less than zero. Uh, actually, let me bring up the table first. Uh, Okay, so here's the table, right? And remember, I inputted all those values for you. So the pro we have the probability that capital Z is between zero and little z. Th those are the probabilities we want. So I'm gonna go back to the notes. So we want the probability that zero is less than X, strictly less than 2.14, minus the probability that zero is less than X, less than, 1.5, right? So the probability that X is strictly between 1.5 and 2.4 um, is the probability that it's between zero and 2.14 minus the probability, it's probably it's, it's between zero and 2.14 and it's not between zero and 1.5, right? Okay, so, so you just look these up. So 2.14 in the table. So if you go 2.14, in the table, so 2.1. So for 2.1, that's 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14. That's four. You add four hundredths to 2.1, so 0 0.4838, 0 0.4838. So you have 0 0.4838 plus, I mean minus, uh, this probably from zero to 1.5. So we want 1.5, but 1.50. So 1.50 is 0 0.4332, 0.4332. This is 0.4332. So this minus that is then 0 0.0506. Uh, okay, because three and the eight is five, and then that, this place is the same, and then eight minus two is six. So you get that. Okay, so that's the probability uh, of the st of standard normal random variable in in between those range of values. For number two in the homework, um, so let's look at the homework again. Um, we have uh, so we have x is a standard random normal again. So find the find z the if find z if the probability x will take on a value. Uh, let's say greater than this z is 0 0.3085. Okay. So find z if the if if the probability that let me just put this here that If find Z if the probability that let me just word this correctly. The X we say find Z if the probability X will take on a value. Okay. Find Z if the probability that X takes on a value greater than little Z is 0 0.3085. Okay, so find z greater than z. So find z if the probability x takes on a value greater than z is 0 0.3085. Remember, x is a standard normal random variable. Let me just check that one more time. x is a standard normal random variable. Yep. Okay, so let's stay here now. Okay, so uh, probably that it's greater than z. So so the probability that X is greater than some value little z is 0 0.3085. That means that the probability that X is less or equal to little z is equal to one minus the probability that X is greater than little z, which is equal to one minus 0.3085 which is equal to 0.6915, okay? 
now the probability that x is less or equal to little z is equal to the probability that x is less or equal to zero plus the probability plus the probability that that zero is less than x less than or equal to z or just less than z because no particular value matters right um, so if that's true we found the probability of the left side it's point six nine one five but that equals the probability x less or equal to zero which is point five plus this probability that zero is less than x less than that little c value and so now solving for the probability of zero less than x less than little z we get that this is equal to 0 0.6915 minus 0 0.5 which is 0 0.1915 okay and so we want from the table is a value of little z such that the probability of zero less than x less than little z is 0 0.1915 and so we just have to look at the table in Appendix C for 0.1915. So 0.1915 right there. There it is. See how the values are decreasing as you go up? So here it's like 0.4. So you want it to be lower. And then so you just start looking around and you go, you get here. 0.1915. So that's for little z is 0 0.50. 0 0.50. Okay, so 0 0.50. Okay. Okay, so that happens from table three in appendix C when little c is equal to 0.5. And that's the answer, okay? Okay, and so that's going over uh, homework seven. Okay, so now let me quickly see if, if I wanna assign homework eight. Um, Okay, so I'm going to sign homework eight for next Wednesday. Okay, so homework eight is going to be for next Wednesday. Uh, wait, get to the right screen. Here we go. No, no, homework eight. Now, okay, homework eight is due next Wednesday, which is four, uh, five, <laughs> five. 2021 okay also uh test three is on is two weeks from today it's on may 12th okay so it's on may 12th 2021 during class okay so it starts at um eight o'clock p.m okay use the normal norm use the weekly uh class zoom link to attend the exam okay same way you attend a regular class use the same zoom link to attend the exam okay so again test three is on it's a wednesday so it's on wednesday may 12th 2021 okay uh uh, during class. So it starts at 8 o'clock p.m. Be on time. Don't be late. Okay. Be on time. Uh, do not be late. Don't miss it. Okay. Do not miss it. Okay. Um, and so I will announce the day of the final uh, on next class Monday. Okay. So I will announce the final date on Monday next class all right uh the review sheet is online okay so the review sheet for test three is online on blackboard uh just go to um, professor the test link and then to the test hello three link. okay i'll answer in a second okay the test three folder and the review is there okay the review sheet is there Okay, yes, question? Oh, sorry, test two. Test two. Test two. Okay, it's test two. 
test two. It's just the number. Okay, so it's test two. Okay, test two is on Wednesday, May 12th, 2021. Okay. No, nobody missed the test. If you had took an exam, you didn't miss any test. This is only the second exam. There was no second exam rate. This is test two. There's only two exams and a final. So this we had the first exam ready. Test two is in two weeks from today on Wednesday, May 12th. Okay, it starts at 8 o'clock p.m. at the start of class. The review sheet for test two is online at Blackboard. Just go to the test link and then go to the test two folder. The review sheet is there. Okay, uh, does that answer everyone's, anyone have any questions about it? Okay. Professor. Okay. All right, so uh, that's it for today. Uh, I'll see you next Monday. Okay. Professor, Bye. I have a quick question. Bye, everyone. You too. Have a good night.